Hello, hello, hello. I am the Linux Mitch. Today, I'm going to talk about seven ways to protect your computer from getting hacked or getting a virus. So, let's get to it. So I created a list here of seven things that I think are good practices. So, number one, don't use unsupported operating system or apps. Very simple. Back in the day, a long, long time ago, before I was using Linux, I was running Windows XP for a year after it expired. It was no longer receiving security updates or anything like that. And there was this website I used to go to. It was a blog I used to read a lot online. And there was a particular blog I used to go to. And one day when I went to it, you know, a thing popped up saying you cannot read this website unless you download these fonts. You don't have the proper fonts. So I clicked it on and downloaded the correct fonts and then the website was working again. But then I realized I had a virus and when I rebooted, I had the Christmas virus. A picture, my whole screen was a picture of Santa Claus and all my files and everything was encrypted. And I couldn't even get my windows to work and a tech guy had to come and fix my computer. So I learned my lesson after that. And I think if I would have been running an updated and supported version of Windows, it probably wouldn't have happened. But maybe it would have. I don't know. You have to be careful what you're clicking on. So that's going to tie in to number three. Number two, update your system often. Now, a lot of people say, uh, you know, I've watched several videos where people are saying you shouldn't update your system because if you update your system, it's going to break. And especially if you're running Arch Linux. Uh I've been running Pure Arch Linux for probably three years now, and I never had my system break from an update. Now, I have had a problem with a couple of apps. When they get updated, they stop working. Uh, the main app is Ramina, which is an app for remoting into other systems. And I've had that app break many times after updating it, but I was all, always able to fix it by downgrading to the previous version. And one time I had a problem, and it was just recently with uh, Caden Live. So I use Caden Live for my editing, for editing my videos. And an update broke the app. It wouldn't work. I couldn't open it. When I went to open it, it crashed. So I downgraded to the previous app, and it was working fine again. And then about maybe three, four, or five days later, Caden Live pushed through an update that fixed it. And I was able to download the most current version of Caden Live and it's working fine now. So those are the only two problems I've had with updating, which are really insignificant when you think about it. And really when you're using Linux or Arch or even when you're using Windows or Apple, you should learn how to fix your system when things go wrong. So like I said, many people say you shouldn't update your system or you should only update it once a month. I don't agree with that. I update my system every day. And especially when there's a kernel update, you should be updating it because the kernel updates have bug fixes and security patches in them, okay? And it, that leads me to number three. You should be careful when clicking on links online and emails. And of course the emails, emails and other things online are becoming more sophisticated and the hackers are getting better at it. So you really have to be careful with that. I think that goes without saying. Number four, use a firewall. And again, many people in the comments of my videos, and I've watched other videos, many people say you don't need a firewall. And their reason is, is that the way modems work now, so for instance, in my apartment, I have four computers and they're all hooked up to the modem and the modem is hooked up to outside. And the way it works is that the modem has an external IP address, and it's the IP address that links to the world outside. Then there's, I have four internal IP addresses that link to my four computers. And all the modems work this way now. I didn't set it up this way, it's just the way it is. And the modem has a firewall in it. So the argument goes, a lot of people give forth this argument that because your modem has an external IP address and a firewall, 
which leads to the internal IP addresses of your computers, therefore you don't need a firewall. And that might be true. I don't know, I'm not a security expert. Uh, but you know what? I always use uncomplicated firewall. If you've been following my install videos or have been following my channel, you know that when I install Arch Linux, I always install uncomplicated firewall. And I always turn it on to deny all incoming. And when I do my videos on Linux Mint, I always go into the graphical GUI and turn on the firewall to deny all incoming. And maybe you really don't need that firewall because your modem has one. But my way of thinking is an extra layer of protection isn't going to hurt. And the thing I like about uncomplicated firewall, it's easy to use. You can use it in a terminal. There's a graphical one that comes with Linux Mint. And you can also download the graphical one for Arch Linux as well. And it's easy to use and it doesn't use a lot of resources. You know, uncomplicated firewall running in the background is not going to use a ton of RAM. It's lightweight and it's just an extra layer of protection. It's better to be safer than not safe. Or should I say it's better to be safer than less safer. And the next thing I'm going to go to is item number five. Turn SSH off when not using it. Now, I don't use SSH. Now, I've done a several videos on it, and I've played with it, but I keep my SSH off. It's always turned off. And when I do want to use it internally between my computers, I turn it on, I use it, and I turn it off. It makes it harder for someone to hack into the system if it's not running. Turn port forward off when not using it. Port forward is this thing that's built into my uh, modem. It's built into yours as well. And with my phone, I can turn on port forward. And if I turn my SSH on and my port forwarding on, I can log into my computer from another location. And I've tried it. It works. And uh, did I do a video on it? Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> but... The thing is, is that when I was playing around with it and experimenting with port forward, I was able to log into my computer from another location, do an update, turn my computer off and access my files. But the thing is that when I was doing that, the app that I use for, uh, that's on my phone that I use for my modem, it showed that people are trying to hack into my system from Russia China, Hong Kong, and there was a couple of other countries too. And because when your port forwarding is on, it's like it's shining a light. Come and get me. I'm here. So there was no damage done. And it kind of scared me. And so I keep my port forwarding off. So if you do have to remote into your system from another location, turn your port forward on. Log into your system, do what you have to do, and turn it off. But I keep it off all the time, and I keep my SSH off all the time because I don't need to log into my computer from another location. When I'm at work, I'm at work. And when I'm at home, I have access to all my computers. The seventh thing and final thing is antivirus software. Now, antivirus software, uh, I used to use it in Windows when I was running uh, Windows 7. And I used to use a free antivirus software online. And of course, I loved it because it was free, right? But it was online. And now I'm thinking back on it. They had access to my whole computer. They would do a scan. And they were scanning my whole system. They had access to all my files, my personal files, my music, my videos, everything. And then it was running in the background. And it was using high system resources, a lot of RAM. And I don't like the fact that an outside service had control or had access to my computer. So I would say that if you're running Windows, and I know this is a Linux uh, video, but if you're running Windows, you should use Windows Defender. It's free and you're not allowing an outside entity to have access to your computer. If you're running Linux, you could run Clam AV. Clam AV is available in every Linux distribution. It's free. 
And the clam AB runs in the uh, terminal, but there's also a GUI front end for it called clam TK. And if you install clam TK, which is also available in all distributions, it's a GUI front end. You can set your antivirus, set the rules for your antivirus. You can set it to do a scan. And you can also, with Clan maybe you can set it to run in the background so it can catch viruses when they come in. Now, I used both. When I first started using Linux uh, four years ago, I had Clam TK installed, and I had it set to do a, a scan of my system once a week. And sometimes there was false positives, and uh, it used to take anywhere from one to three hours to do a scan. At first it was just taking an hour and then it ended up taking longer. It used to take two or three hours to do a scan. And after a while I stopped using it and I never had it running in the background. So it's kind of moot in a way because if you're just using it to do a scan, it's not protecting you from getting a virus. And if you do get a virus, then what are you gonna do? Do you know how to get rid of the virus? Or are you just going to do a fresh install? So I stopped using it. I still have it installed on my system. And once in a while, I do a scan maybe once every two months. But not through the GUI one, just in the terminal. And I have a configuration file for it to ignore certain folders that I don't think it needs to look in. So number seven is sort of just a way to, if you're going to run clam maybe, it's sort of, just a way if you need to check a file or a folder or you want to check your system just to assure yourself that you don't have any viruses now the thing about antivirus whether it's uh, the free ones or the ones you pay for it they're only as good as if the virus has been discovered if the virus has hasn't been discovered and they haven't written a signature for it yet then it's not going to catch it now the other thing is too is that Linux is less likely to get a virus because people aren't making viruses for it. Because uh, Linux is has such a small share of the market, I think at like something like 3% of all computers or 2% of all computers in the world are running Linux. People aren't making viruses for Linux. Now it doesn't mean there are never viruses or malware for Linux, but most of the people who are the bad actors who are making viruses and malware, they're doing it for Windows because they have the majority a share of the computer system in the world. And of course, they're trying to make it for Apple as well. And while we're on the topic, I think Apple is more secure than Windows, but that's another story. So now you might be wondering, what about this XD backdoor thing that happened just over a week ago? Well, that was from a uh, developer or developers that were working on the XE file and the XE file are files that are in all Linux distributions and I really don't know much about it except that they help your computer to run and they were connected to the SSH files so number one it didn't affect Debian stable number two it didn't really affect Arch a lot of people are saying ah oh, see Arch Linux it's a rolling distribution you're going to download some malware. Well, in Arch Linux, it didn't really affect it. Even though Arch Linux posted a notice about it right away on their main web page, and they did an update about it right away. They updated the XE file so it didn't have the malware in it or the back door in it. And secondly, it really didn't affect Arch Linux because the libraries that the XZ file was the libraries that the XE file uses to connect to SSH in Arch Linux, there is no bridge. Arch Linux doesn't have a bridge between XE files and those particular libraries that would have connected it to the SSH. So it probably wouldn't have done any damage anyways, and it wouldn't have left your computer open to attack, and the backdoor wouldn't have worked in Arch Linux. So really, it was insignificant. And the fact that it got caught right away was a thumbs up for the Linux community. Now I'm going to give you a bonus tip, and that's number eight. And I know I said I was going to give you seven, but let's do eight. And that's the AUR. And that only applies to those of you that are using Arch Linux. 
and be careful with the AUR. I try not to download and install a lot of packages from the AUR. Right now, I don't have anything on this computer from the AUR. And of course, I've done videos showing how to manually install stuff from the AUR. And I've done videos showing how to use Ye and Paru, the AUR helpers. But right now, like I said, I don't have anything from the AUR. And when I have used AUR packages, I try to keep it to a minimal, like maybe one, two, or at the most three. I don't have dozens of AUR packages on my system. I never had. And when you use the AUR, you should look at the package build and make sure there's nothing funny in there. But then again, unless you're a program writer or a developer, there could be something in there that's not right and you may not notice it. And that's it.